Hey there folks, this is Daniel Fritter from Caliber Magazine, and today we're going to be discussing the 2024 Public Safety Canada Department Plan. As the name implies, this is a document where public safety basically says what they're going to do for the next fiscal year, and it's already gotten a lot of attention from gun owners, not necessarily because of what it says, but rather a couple notable omissions for the next coming year. Uh, we're going to discuss what that means and some misconceptions that people might already be having about that, but first I want to have a little bit of a brief word from our sponsor, as it were, which is Caliber Magazine, the channel that you're actually watching is responsible for producing an actual print magazine that we've been doing for 12 years now and it's this magazine that actually supports this entire channel and the coverage that you're watching uh, for 30 bucks a year you can get a subscription to this we mail it directly to your door and inside there's lots of coverage of canadian guns this first issue of 2024 for example has a canadian gun on the cover that's from specter ballistics international it's a 1022 sort of gun that you can get here in canada manufactured in alberta uh, and we proudly support a lot of canadian industry within but also too if you like this sort of content, we go into a lot more depth on regulatory, legislative and legal changes, politics and such like that, because uh, within the confines of YouTube, we're somewhat limited by time and my ability to speak properly, which is somewhat limited in most cases. Um, so for those of you that want to support it, like I said, there's a link in the description below where you can get a subscription. I much appreciate everyone's support. And like I said, it's how we kind of do this sort of thing. Um, so to get back to the subject matter at hand, the 2024 department plan came out yesterday and immediately got some attention from gun owners because it makes no mention of either the individual buyback slash confiscation slash compensation program, nor does it make any mention of the pending and expected magazine limit regulation changes that we've been told to expect in 2024. We'll get into that a little bit later because that's the one where I think there's been some misconceptions. But briefly to get into the individual buyback confiscation compensation program some explanation the firearms buyback program was launched in may of 2020 we've discussed it at length on this channel it was launched by then minister of public safety bill blair and justin trudeau pretty much immediately after the port of peak massacre and it was an attempt to largely get some of the celebrity status enjoyed by jacinda ardern's government in new zealand after she banned so-called assault style weapons in that country um, they have changed the name, it seems, to the Firearms Compensation Program, likely because of pushback on the term buyback, which is hugely problematic for reasons that people will no doubt tell me in the comments ad nauseum. And as I have said in the past, I understand I just use the terminology that the government does to prevent confusion. It doesn't help when the government changes their terminology and makes it more confusing for everyone involved. However, I digress. Um, in the 2024 plan, there is mention of this program, but it does not pertain to the individual one. Last year's department plan specified that public safety would be completing uh, the compensation program, the design of the compensation program in 2023 and would be launching the program in 2024. This year's department plan continues that by saying that they will be launching the compensation program later this year, but that it will be specifically open to businesses only. This isn't overly surprising. We've known this for a long time. When the buyback program was first announced, it was announced that it would be uh, brought in in a phased introduction with businesses coming first and individuals later later, likely because there are a lot less businesses that the government will have to interface with, as well as because businesses are likely going to be where the government sees the highest compliance rate. Uh, this is a subject that has been debated online at length. It's very controversial, but effectively it boils down to the fact that while individuals can choose to keep these guns as long as the amnesty exists, which is until October of 2025, businesses can do so as well. However, for businesses, it impacts their operating capital. What I mean by that is those of us that have these guns, I have AR-15s, uh, keeping them in my gun safe does not incur a dramatic amount of cost to me. All I am out is the retail price for those guns, which I paid years ago. Uh, but for businesses, they may have a huge amount of money wrapped up in these guns, far more than me, uh, far more than anyone else, to be honest, hundreds of thousands and potentially millions of dollars. But moreover, warehousing these guns is incurring additional monthly costs. For any businesses that deal with guns or any retail industry, you work in square footage. Uh, if you have a bunch of guns you can't sell, they are occupying square footage in your space that could otherwise be taken up by other stuff to say nothing of the dollar figure attached to these guns. 
if you had a gun shop and you were stuck holding on to $250,000 worth of AR-15s and Ruger Mini-14s that you can't sell and haven't been able to do anything with for four years, you would likely be getting very frustrated watching guns like the Smith & Wesson uh, folding pistol caliber carbine or the Ruger PC carbines, very popular guns, that if you had the revenue, the operating capital, you could be bringing in in higher volumes, realizing profits on and expanding your operation. That's what this is costing uh, retailers. And that's why I think the government is likely going to be targeting uh, businesses first, because businesses will have an additional inducement to comply with this stuff, to get a check from the government, especially these days with the costs of everything going up, inflationary spending, all that, uh, everything from your, your heating to your costs of staffing to your lease rates on your retail storefront, everything is getting more expensive for business owners. So the government can really depressingly and cynically leverage a lot of that stuff to try and get as many of these guns out of businesses' hands as possible so that they can roll into the next election with something to show for this entire program. Now, like I said, none of this has to happen. Businesses can retain these guns due to the amnesty, but because of those economic conditions that I stated as well, we're likely going to see at least some businesses participate. And this is where I would caution, this is a bit of an editorial note, I would caution the gun community to be a little bit uh, cautious about jumping down people's throats on this because, well, there is a principled stance to take around all of this stuff. Uh, businesses should keep the guns just like individuals. We obviously all want to have a show of solidarity against this sort of thing. To show the government this program is not getting compliance would be fantastic. But if our community starts losing gun shops again, we've lost so many in the last four years due to both regulatory and economic conditions, that if we start losing more of our local gun shops because they're stuck holding on to this stock that they can't do anything with, uh, it's not going to be beneficial to our community, our sport, our hobby in any way, shape, or form. These gun shops, they support our competitions, they sponsor our gun clubs, and they introduce new shooters to these. If you can't get a gun in your local town, you're not going to get new shooters. Um, and especially the guns that we're specifically referring to are oftentimes kept in inventory or were kept in inventory by some of the gun shops who are some of the most heavily supportive of our shooting community. Um, not necessarily hunting specific shops that sold fishing rods primarily and a couple you know, shotguns on the side. These are guns that were sold by gun shops and kind of the, the brick and mortar shops that are the lifeblood of our community. So keeping those stores open is tremendously important. And that's where I would just say, you know, I'm digressing a bit here more than I want to, but um, to be a little bit cautious, I know in the past I've seen a lot of gun owners get pretty incensed about the issue of whether or not businesses should participate. Uh, I just wanted to kind of throw it out there that uh, the situation, the reality on the ground for businesses is a little bit different. I don't consider myself, in case anyone wants to be, you know, ah, Dan's biased. I'm not, I don't have a stake in this. I don't sell guns. We never have, so it's not an issue for me. But I do correspond with a lot of these folks and can say, uh, it is an issue for a lot of them. And I think anyone just has to look through the last three years and all of the gun shops that have gone bankrupt in the last few years for evidence that this could be a healthy choice for a lot of gun shops to make. Now, the second thing that's getting a lot of attention in the 2024 departmental plan is the complete omission of any mention of magazine regulation. At the tail end of 2023, around when C-21 was receiving royal assent, gun owners were told to expect an order in council that would see the regulations around magazine capacity changed so that all long gun magazines would have to have their bodies permanently altered such that the magazine could not contain more than five rounds. Uh, I'm not going to go into huge depth on this, but I will say historically speaking, this is how we used to limit standard capacity magazines. A popper of it would be introduced in the side of the body that would limit the follower from getting all the way down, hereby limiting the capacity of the magazine. This regulation aims to change that and the government wants to basically see magazine bodies like this either have something welded to them or the body itself be crimped so that the follower can't descend further down. The concern being that people can simply remove the rivet. Uh, that would be illegal so people that have licenses don't do it. Uh, but this is exactly where we stand with the federal government with regards to gun regulation. But um, that said, a lot of people are noticing that because there is no mention of magazine regulation within the plan, that perhaps that means the government is sort of taking their foot off the gas. So I reached out to the Minister of Public Safety to see what they had to say on it, and they did actually reply, uh, basically saying, well, not basically, I'll read it verbatim here, saying that the departmental plans are expenditure plans for the department. They describe departmental priorities, strategic outcomes, programs, expected results, and associated resource requirements covering a three-year period. 
The report is not meant to detail all the initiatives that public safety is pursuing. Public Safety Canada continues to explore options for meeting the Minister of Public Safety's mandate letter commitments on large capacity magazines. Consultations will be undertaken before any regulation is made. More information will be made public in due course. Uh, this was in reference specifically to the omission of magazine regulations and asking whether or not that remained a priority for the government for 2024. From that response, I think we can probably surmise that it does remain something that they are still working on, that it will likely be launched in 2024, but because it doesn't represent an expenditure program, there is no required budget for this regulatory change, that it doesn't need to be included in the 2024 departmental plan. Uh, this is kind of borne out by the fact that there was no mention of magazine regulations in the 2023 departmental plan either, although this has been something we have known the RCMP and public safety to be working through since about 2020 or 2021 or so. So it's been a long-standing goal for them uh, that it's not included on the plan does not seem to indicate that it may not come to pass this year. Nothing seems to really be changing in that regard. Uh, however, we do now know that there will be consultations introduced before any regulations made. And when they say that, they mean likely formal consultations which are announced on Public Safety's website and there's something that we can track. So we will have some indication of when that will be coming likely beforehand as as a result of these consultations. Um, so that's where we stand for the 2024 regulatory plan. The individual buyback, to recap, the individual buyback will not be launching in 2024. The business one likely will uh, for reasons like I stipulated of getting some sort of compliance rate before the next election comes up. And as mentioned, if anyone's getting concerned, um, again, the amnesty exists to protect everyone that owns these guns from being charged until October of 2025. So there's no obligation for businesses to participate, but nonetheless, due to economic conditions, some likely will. Uh, and with the magazine regulations, although not included on the departmental plan, they probably are still going to be coming out later on this year, but only after we get some indication with consultations. I suspect that those consultations will likely be to sort of steer this away from some of the more problematic situations with the stipulation that had been previously stated that all long gun magazines would have to be limited to five. The most obvious problem with that would be lever action rifles, pump action shotguns, anything with a tubular magazine. I think that would be very problematic for the government to get around. Um, but that said, I think everything with a removal magazine is likely to be impacted. And I suspect that they'll use the consultations to steer it in that particular direction. Uh, that said, if anyone's looking for additional clarity, there has been a technical briefing on this where it was asked whether or not this would impact, for example, the Lee Enfield, which is a bolt action rifle that uses a 10 round detachable magazine. Uh, the government did stipulate the Lee Enfield was one of the guns that they were looking to capture with the regulation. So it is unlikely to be limited to semi-automatic. It is unlikely to be limited to um, center fire or uh, rim fire rifles. I think it will be all long guns with detachable magazines will have to be limited to five. Uh, it's going to be a huge problem, but nonetheless, this is all gearing up for the next election. If you want more information on that, check out the previous video where we discuss uh, how a lot of these regulations are likely nothing more than the electioneering process of the Liberal government trying to create wedges in preparation for the next election against Pierre Polyev. Um, so that's pretty much everything we've got for the 2024 departmental plan. We're looking for more documentation from the government coming out. We'll do more videos as they do. We've actually got a couple of videos was planned, including an interview with a senator where we discuss the role of the Senate and the constitutional impacts of the Senate's makeup with regards to potential uh, repealment of these gun bans. So uh, like, comment, subscribe, all that. I will be down there in the comments section replying for as long as I can. Uh, and for those of you that, like I said, have subscribed to support what we're doing, thank you so much. Um, check out the link in the description to our actual print magazine and subscribe there if you want to support more of this. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks.